Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us again. For those of you who have just signed in, my name is Stefan Haggard. I direct the Korea Pacific program at, at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at GPS. Um, we've been putting this webinar series on partly to entertain ourselves and keep ourselves sane in the absence of ability to deliver more standard seminars. Uh, let me just talk about several of the things that are coming up in the next week. Curtis? Thanks. Uh, before I do that, though, uh, for those of you who are not in the GPS community, who are coming to us either from the humanities or not connected with UCSD and GPS at all, GPS is a graduate school of international affairs and public policy at UCSD. We offer a number of degree programs, including a Master of International Affairs uh, that has a Korea specialization. I work on this program with Moon Sub Lee, an economist who's joined us over the last couple of years. And I also work with uh, Todd Henry and Jin Kyung Lee, who we'll introduce uh, shortly. Curtis? So let me just introduce very quickly two events that are coming up uh, later uh, this week and next week. Uh, tomorrow, June 2nd, I'm going to do another book launch with one of our colleagues, Ulrika Sheda, who has written a book called The Business Reinvention of Japan. And it's a very interesting book that basically argues that we've underestimated Japan. And so we'll have a discussion of that book, also obviously putting it in the context of relations, uh, the political economy of Northeast Asia and Japan's relations with Korea. So feel free to join us on that webinar tomorrow at four. You can sign up and register for that on the website as well. And then next week, I'm particularly proud of a, of a, uh, a panel we're going to have on succession in North Korea. Obviously, we know that Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un is back in the news. He's visible, but his absence, three absences actually over the course of this year have raised the question of what would happen were he actually to disappear permanently from the scene. Michael Madden is the founder of North Korea Watch, and North Korea Leadership Watch. He uh, spends a lot of time watching the North Korean leadership. Dan Pinkston is a PhD from GPS, who is a Troy University and based in Seoul. And Joseph Wright has written some very good things on personalism in uh, the North Korean political system. So I look forward to that. That's also at four. If you can get on and register, that would be great. Let me now turn to today's event, um, which is a, a book launch by one of our colleagues. And of course, we're always particularly happy to showcase the work of our great UCSD scholars. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Todd, uh, Todd indirectly through uh, my colleague Joe Bettles in a moment. But before I get to that, let me just remind people of the protocol and how these sessions work. If you have a question, post it on the Q&A. Uh, obviously, you're all muted because there are about 80 of us now. Uh, but if you post your question on the q and I'll make sure it gets asked. I'll try to bundle questions together and we'll do our best to get to everyone. We've had pretty good luck in doing that. Uh, so let me uh, introduce uh, Joe Bettles. Joe Bettles leads Quirps, which is the LGBTQ plus uh, club at GPS. And Joe has really done an excellent job both in sponsoring social events substantive events on the queer community uh, in the United States and elsewhere, and also in making for a welcoming environment at GPS for our, our uh, LGBTQ plus uh, colleagues. Joe, you want to introduce Todd, and then uh, Todd will speak, and then I'll introduce Jin Kyung Lee, and we'll turn quickly to questions. Great. Thank you, Professor Haggard. Um, so in the US, many of us think of the LGBTQ history as beginning with Stonewall and ending with gay marriage. But of course, queerness is not something that fits neatly into a beginning, middle, and end. And it certainly does not have an end that is assimilation. Queerness has always existed around the world as an interconnected part of the cultural and political landscape. This is not, or, sorry, excuse me, this is the frame that shapes the discussion today of queer identity in Korea. Queer Korea is an interdisciplinary volume that looks beneath the headlines of marriage equality for a deeper discussion of non-normative sexualities and gender variants that have always been part of the peninsula. It looks to Cold War Korea as a rich source for the history of queerness that has been systematically ignored 
minimized and erased. And much in the way that the book was the culmination of an ongoing dialogue that began with a film festival and an art installation at UCSD, Queer Korea opens up the discussion rather than staking its claim on history. The, collabor the collaborative and discursive qualities of the volume of 10 contributions makes it a perfect launching point for our discussion today. We had, of course, hoped to be able to have this talk in person, but in a time of isolation, as well as deep and painful reflection of history and identity, it is even more important to be reaching out to have these conversations today. This feels like a singular time when reimagining how we see each other feels possible. But because identities and histories are messy and complex, we need guidance through lived experience and scholarship to help us shape our reimagining. I am so pleased today to introduce everyone to the editor of this volume, Professor Todd Henry. Professor Henry is a specialist of modern Korea. He has received two Fulbright grants to study in Korea, where I believe he also did a brief stint working in a gay bar. Professor Henry has also served as the inaugural director of the Transnational Korean Studies until 2018. He is currently working on a second book, The Prophet of Queerness, that examines the queer subculture in Cold War South Korea, from which an excerpt is included in this volume. I will now pass it off to Professor Todd Henry. Todd, if you could unmute. Todd, you need to unmute. There you go. Sorry, can everybody hear me now? Great. Um, let me just um, put up the slides for you. Um, so I want to um, thank everybody for, for being here today. Um, I especially want to thank um, Steph, um, Joe, Curtis, um, Jennifer, uh, Jin Gyeong, and everybody else who made this event um, possible. Um, and I also uh, would like to thank the various um, authors um, who uh, helped create um, the volume. So what I thought I would do today uh, is to give you a little bit of background about the volume, how it came into being, um, as well as, as some of the contributions. And then um, I would uh, like to look forward to um, your questions. Um, and I put this up just by way of introduction because the book was published in, um, in February. Uh, and then uh, right when the book was published and we were all hoping we would meet in person, um, COVID-19 swept across the world uh, and uh, put us all in our homes um, and um, feeling isolated and um, wanting connection. Um, and it's in that context um, that I wanted to um, sort of introduce the importance of the volume about the presence of queer communities in South Korea um, as the COVID-19 crisis um, uh, has hit. If you're in the United States, you're probably familiar with the mass media news reports about the way in which South Korea very quickly um, and having learned from the mayor's crisis of not too long ago, um, instituted a number of public health measures um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, um, including um, contract tracing, uh, contact tracing that is. And um, I put up this uh, piece just to show you um, another side of the story uh, about the various effects that contact tracing has had on LGBT communities um, because the same system of public health surveillance that is supposed to limit the spread of COVID um, in the context of uh, gay and lesbian people frequenting certain kinds of social spaces and then those social spaces being outed by the mass media um, has created a, a, quite a crisis um, and fear among uh, queer communities in South Korea that um, their movements can be tracked and traced uh, by the government um, and other um, using other kinds of um, technologies um, to do so. So I just present that to you as a, as a kind of starting point um, for our discussion, especially in the context 
of many LGBT communities um, in South Korea that don't rely on um, coming out models or um, necessarily um, rely on um, pride um, events, although of course there are those um, ev events as well, uh, but use a, a, a sort of under the radar or off the radar strategy um, in order to survive in a society that is still very hostile to being LGBT, both uh, in families, um, in workplaces, in the military, in universities, um, and other contexts. Here is the image I wanted to show you about um, the connection between South Korea's uh, coronavirus contact tracing and the surveillance of LGBT populations. This is a, a NPR story that um, you can listen to if you're interested that um, interviews a lot of activists in South Korea um, voicing their concerns about the way contact tracing and mass media outing of South Koreans is affecting um, their um, livelihood. This is the picture I wanted to show you. It's a little embarrassing because there's some pictures of me um, here um, when I um, still had hair and when I wore glasses. Um, so this is a, a bit of a kind of a way of describing the origins of the book, um, which go back to my own first encounters with Korea in the late um, 1990s. Um, I started graduate school in 1999 um, and the book was part of actually my own coming out process as a gay man um, and someone who was interested also in learning and supporting from LGBT communities um, in South Korea, where I first visited in um, 1998. So these pictures are from 2003, uh, when I was in South Korea first for dissertation research. The picture on the upper left with the rainbow painted onto my face is one of the first LGBT pride festivals. I mentioned that um, those do exist in South Korea. Last year, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of pride um, celebrations. And on the right, you can see an image. Um, I believe Joe mentioned earlier that I had a stint um, in a gay bar. This is a picture of the bar. Um, it still exists in Seoul. It's called Soho. And you can um, notice um, this uh, man down here with the blue um, sweater or sweatshirt, he was my fellow bartender. And this was actually a heterosexual family that also often came to the bar before we opened. Um, and we had conversations about, about all kinds of things. At that time, I was quite struck by something um, I heard quite a lot from people around me. Um, and that is that there are no gay people in Korea. Um, it's something that's becoming less um, possible um, and feasible to say in today's world, but certainly um, in the early 2000s, it's something that um, I heard quite often and it left me a bit confused because here I was uh, participating in pride festivals and working at a gay bar and also working with student activists at Seoul National University in one of their um, student organizations. So. Uh, my uh, res gut response when people said that there were no gay people in Korea was, well, I meet them all the time. Would you like me to introduce me uh, to some of them? But it seemed to me that, um, jokes aside, that the problem was uh, more um, significant than that. Um, and one of the things I think that was meant by there are no gay people in Korea is that gay people had, and lesbians and transgender people, had quite a difficulty in making themselves um, visible. Um, and this is something that was quite different from my own um, upbringing in the United States and something that I had to get used to while working with South Korean activists. So I mentioned that I participated in one of the student uh, movements at Seoul National University. Um, the first student group was established in 1995. So when I arrived in the early 2000s, there, it was about the fifth year in which student groups existed. We had a small room in the student center, no sign on the door uh, for fear that people walking in and out, um, if it said LGBT center or something like that, the students feared that they might be outed by fellow students, might face serious consequences, bullying, um, that might lead to them being um, outed to other family members. And so we had to, and I quickly learned a kind of fine line between community organizing outside of uh, the visibility, often of the media, um, of the school itself. Um, and this 
manifested itself in all kinds of difficulties. For example, at that time, there was a famous transgender star, her name is uh, Harisu, who had recently come out of the closet. Um, she was known um, in the world of um, music and she had been uh, promoted on cosmetic um, uh, advertisements and we wanted to invite her to campus for a speech. She agreed to come, um, but one of the biggest problems we faced was how to introduce the speaker. So Joe here is able to introduce me as a speaker and uh, present himself and present his credentials. The problem we faced is no one in the group wanted to introduce the speaker. Um, I volunteered to introduce the speaker, but one of the things I felt very strongly about is trying to allow uh, Koreans the spotlight for talking about queer issues. I understood myself as an ally and a supporter. And so um, that gives you a, um, a kind of sense of the tension between on the one hand, trying to present issues of importance um, beyond our community and the possibility that we could face recriminations um, for doing so. So the book really came out of that kind of um, sense of urgency um, that I felt um, when I first studied in um, Korea. Um, as someone who uh, was trained in history, I wanted to try to also in the book and in my work account for um, a longer history um, the activists who I met in the early 2000s, and I think much can be said um, about today, are very much involved in present day issues. That is the issues that are affecting LGBT youth, um, issues around homelessness, about lack of um, financial resources, inability to find classes on student campuses. They're very much related to in the present um, moments. And so it was, quite difficult for the people who are interested in these issues to really take the time uh, to go back through written materials or do oral history interviews or look at artwork. Um, it's quite a privilege, in fact, to be a scholar and to have resources uh, to spend your time focusing on these issues um, while many people are involved in the day-to-day -day, um, uh, work of doing um, activism. So I uh, embarked on um, the project for this book um, in uh, uh, 2013 when I was on my first sabbatical from UCSD. Um, and what I wanted to show you here is something that was quite startling to me. Um, I had heard, of course, the no gays myth. I already spoke to you about that. But the other thing that happened in 2013 was a very famous activist and filmmaker who I had been working with um, you see him on the left here, this picture, this is Kim Jo Gwangsu and his boyfriend of many years. And they held a public wedding ceremony in the middle of Seoul outside in a space that's usually occupied by heterosexual couples. This is actually the, um, uh, an anecdote I opened the book with and quite remark rem remarkable to see the headlines at the time. I don't know if you can see it in Korean. I'll translate it for you in English. It just says Kim Jo Gwangsu and Kim Sung Hwan, um, his partner, uh, participated in the country's first um, same-sex wedding. And at that time, I was going back through uh, week weekly publications from the same period, um, and I came across this article. This is from 1970, and it basically says the exact same thing, um, Korea's first same-sex ceremony. Now, you'll notice a number of differences between the two images. Um, over here on the left, by the early 2000s, there had emerged in um, reaction to LGBT activism, a very strong anti-LGBT activist movement that is grounded in fundamental um, Christian protests. Um, you'll see a member of that anti-LGBT group here uh, coming up on stage with a uh, banner um, uh, posting homophobic uh, statements. There were other people at the time who literally threw um, human feces onto the stage while all of us were trying to celebrate this important um, wedding. So in 1970, the image over here, this is the period when South Korea was under authoritarian rule. It was before Korea's transition to democracy. Remarkably, there were other um, same-sex um, stories that were reported about in the media um, this is actually two women um, who used a 
uh, Buddhist temple to try to get a priest um, uh, to preside over um, their wedding ceremony. Uh, one woman wear, wearing a hanbok over here on the right side and the other female partner dressing um, in a male style suit. Um, and um, also uh, a picture down here hosting a party um, for it looks like family members and relatives um, uh, after um, the event. So the book um, and my own contribution tries to make um, connections between um, a past of queerness in Korea that has been largely forgotten about, erased, uh, misrepresented, and relating it to the kinds of struggles that uh, South Koreans um, face today. Not in any coherent or linear way, but trying to make some connections about the, the role, for example, of the mass media and circulating certain kinds of images about queer people. And I got to thinking that quite literally people who were reading these kinds of stories had to forget each and every time a new story of a same-sex intimacy happened, you had to forget about it in order to think about it as new. Um, and so it made me think also about the kinds of resources and archives we use. This image over here from 1970, this is a weekly publication, a kind of sensationalist tabloid publication that would be um, emergent every month and people would literally throw out the issue. So you have to also think about how people read and consume these stories of um, queer or um, gender non-conforming people by actually throwing out the story, throwing the story into the trash can. So the book um, is really aimed then at trying uh, to um, overturn this um, no gaze um, myth, which didn't simply permeate Korean society as a kind of urban legend, but really also um, found its way into my own field of study, which is Korean studies or Asian studies, where we have quite a strong literature for Japan or for China or for Southeast Asia, but quite literally uh, almost nothing for the case of Korea. The things we have are mostly, mostly date to the 1990s and after the era of um, democracy in South Korea, but nothing for the period of South Korea's authoritarianism, the period of South Korea's rule by Japan in the early 20th um, century. So I tried to make with this book a kind of uh, intervention to break apart the conservatism that pervades um, the academic world, um, not just in Korea, but in the United States and elsewhere. Um, in Korea especially, you know, uh, it's very difficult uh, to produce this kind of work. Um, there are very few courses in South Korean universities. There are virtually no professors who could guide graduate student masters and uh, doctoral dissertations. Um, and there's very little hope of someone who writes a topic on, writes a dissertation or thesis on this topic would ever find employment in a South Korean university. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to do in my own activism is to try to make, try my best to use my own uh, privilege and power uh, to encourage South Korean universities to uh, establish new um, classes or hire new faculty and encourage a new generation of people uh, to join this uh, burgeoning um, field of study. Um, this is the last slide I want to share with you. This is a table of contents of the volume. Um, it includes um, scholarship by um, scholars of literature, um, scholars of history, uh, film studies, anthropology, uh, transgender studies, uh, and more. Um, and I consider the approaches we take in the volume to be uh, about three different areas um, of queer studies. And I'll just kind of um, try to go over those quickly and make them as intelligible as possible. Uh, the first approach is minoritizing. Um, and by that, I simply mean we're interested in um, discovering and speaking about unknown subcultures that for various reasons don't appear in our scholarship, aren't part of our textbooks, um, aren't major figures, 
um, but nonetheless um, have a place in the past, in historical archives, in art archives, in films, um, in other registers that don't get captured um, for historical um, study. Uh, some people using um, ephemera. There is, of course, a problem and a tendency of a minoritizing approach to subcultures, of being kind of put in a ghetto um, where maybe uh, scholars who are less open to these topics might say, well, what do um, LGBT or what does sexual non-normativity or gender variance have anything to do with Korea at large? You're simply talking about a very small minority. And in fact, the word that's used in Korea for LGBT, which is song sosuja, literally sexual minority, many people's reaction to that word is literally you're speaking of a minority. So um, why do we need to focus on that minority as opposed to any other minority? The second approach, the universalizing approach, um, takes um, issue with that um, critique by trying to show how regimes of normativity um, whether they're normativity related to gender and sexuality, or whether they're regimes of normativity that relate to capitalism or militarism or family life, the kinds of issues that Korean studies and social science scholars are interested in have a lot to do with LGBT people. Um, that is to say, LGBT people can allow us to see the certain operations of power um, that require um, careful um, analysis. The last approach that's taken in the book I call provincializing. Um, for those of you who have read Depesh Chakrabarti's book, Provincializing Europe, uh, know that much um, work um, has been done to try to decenter um, the um, position of the United States of Europe, uh, generally of the West, in discussions of queer studies. So the volume. Um, asks, you know, what, for example, if um, a state or the media or even society itself cannot be relied upon for the protection of minority populations? What if visibility is not the basis of political activism, but in fact jeopardizes the well being of those most uh, disenfranchised? And I think to try to make connections to the protests that are going on right now as we speak. I had to turn off my TV before we started, but there are protesters in front of the White House now speaking, trying to speak to President Trump. I think this uh, has a lot to say about um, the kinds of discrimination that African American and other minority populations face um, in this country, where the state or the media or the police, the people who are supposed to be protecting us are actually failing. Um, and we need certain other kinds of uh, bonds, communities, and intimacies um, in order to um, allow us to survive. So that's really um, all I have um, today. Uh, this is the cover of the book. And um, if you're interested in the discussion you hear today and, and you'd like to purchase the book, um, you can do so anywhere um, online or in your local bookstores. Um, there's a link here to the Duke University website. Um, to, to purchase it. So thank you very much for joining me and I look forward to answering your questions. Todd, that, that was really terrific. I, it's just a great overview that blends together your personal experience with the type of scholarship that's going on. It's exactly what we're looking for. I just have one quick question that's already come in, which is whether uh, any, anyone can get a hold of your slides in some way. If you, we can talk about how we can do that. I'm sure they'll be available. Maybe we can uh, figure out how to put them up. Happy to share. I next want to introduce uh, Jin Kyung Lee. Um, she asked that I give a quite minimal introduction, and I'm generally going to honor that, except to say that she's been a staunch supporter of Korean studies on campus. She directs the Transnational Korean Studies program, which Todd founded uh, with GPS support. And she has written actually on a number of the topics that are germane to this whole discussion, including uh, sex work and militarism in Korea. Jin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. 
So I actually remember to <laughs> unmute myself. Thank you so much for inviting me. And that was a great um, overview of, of your work, of the edited volume. And um, I wanted to just wanted to say, I, I'm going to make my uh, questions very brief, as brief as possible. Um, I know all of the um, articles, essays included in the volume. I was part of the conference that uh, Todd organized uh, year, several years back. And then um, I also taught uh, the introduction uh, in uh, one of my classes very recently, uh, last year. And uh, it was just excellent. So the quality of all of these essays uh, are just at such a high level. And uh, Todd did such a wonderful job of um, gathering all these top-notch younger, younger scholars. So um, I'm, I'm so happy that this book is out and that we can all use it in our classes and uh, because there is such a dearth of uh, usable materials uh, on this topic. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, putting out this volume and all your work. Um, so my first question uh, was pretty much uh, addressed in Todd's introduction. So uh, I'm going to, my question was originally to really um, I know that Todd has been so sensitive uh, and uh, careful in terms of uh, how he positions himself as a, a U.S. scholar in South Korea and in all of his work in relation to the South Korean activists and the scholars, especially younger scholars and so on, so uh, playing the, the role of the mentor. So that was my um, question and uh, to modify the question a little bit or uh, part of the question was to maybe if you can talk most your most recent experience of, of uh, uh, your activism in South Korea when you were there for, uh, for a year like a couple years back right so uh, if, if you could just tell us an anecdote or whatever impressed you you know the, uh, the difference between your earlier experiences with their activists back then and now and so on or some, something along those lines uh, uh, a, a personal uh, experience that that would be interesting. The the second question I wanted to ask was, um, having read uh, the introduction as well as uh, I think maybe possibly I I know that I read one one rough draft of the the other book that single authored book that he's writing on the queer history in in Korea in post post forty five uh, South Korea, and uh, uh, and then I heard presentations and. Uh, by Todd, uh, you know, from excerpts from the, the ongoing book. And I was just so impressed with the, the ways in which that he was able to write this history. And in terms of the methodology, in terms of a uh, methodology of like how to find materials, because these are really uh, obscured history, right? The marginalized history that you really have to go dig deep in, in order to find materials. So. Um, and then to how to conceptualize uh, and fill in the gaps and so on. So it seems like such a, a daunting task to me. Uh, but of course, in principle, uh, the, everything, this particular methodology of you know, detective work and guessing and filling in, uh, that's actually, it's identical to other. Uh, it's, it's generalizable and identical in principle to all of the history, the kinds of history that we, we write, right? The cultural history and other social history and so on, uh, in, on all the other topics. So you, you're always uh, being compelled to fill in these gaps and make guesses and possibly wrong guesses and so on. So uh, I was wondering how you would, uh, how you would uh, conceptualize or how, what you would think about um, the methodological, theoretical, um, historiographical contribution that you your work would make, including this edited volume as well as you already talked about this a little bit in, at, at the very end of your presentation. Um, that that you would the difficulty of the kinds of work that you're you're doing in uh, digging up this uh, history that's been erased that uh, that just completely uh, forgotten and, and uh, like what, what kinds of contribution, what, what kinds of inter intervention your work would make in uh, fields, in the field of history in general. The other question is also related to what you mentioned in, in conjunction with what's going on uh, right now t uh, today uh, in the past week or so, the, the ongoing protest. Uh, and uh, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the kinds of violence that the South Korean queer folks uh, endure, um, whether it be physical violence, whether it be emotional, social, 
and other kinds of violence that, uh, that are part of their everyday lives. So thank you so much. This is a great book. So <laughs> I hope more people can uh, use it for in their classes, for one thing. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. You can take a few minutes on those, Todd. I've got a, a queue of about three questions. I just want to remind people uh, before you answer that if you have a question, uh, feel free to put it up in the Q&A section. I'll moderate those. And um, if you choose to be anonymous, I'm not going to be reading off names. That's perfectly fine for you to do that as well. Todd? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll try to be quick so I can answer um, other questions as well. Um, in terms of the methodology, I mean, I'm, I'm trained as a historian, so I'm doing historical work, but um, also increasingly interested um, in, in media because one of the differences I find with Korea, let's say as compared to US LGBT history or Japan or maybe some other places I'm familiar with is there's a, there's a body of text that one can rely on let's say starting in the 60s and 70s, whether you know, it's the homophile movement in the United States or whether it's other kinds of commercial um, journals that emerged um, in other places and represented um, certain communities. Um, in the case of Korea, we don't get what we might call self-textualization, that is people writing about themselves until probably the 1990s. So the sources we have to rely on are very much outside sources. So they're reporters looking in or they're doctors looking in or they're police officers maybe making an arrest on the street. So um, it's true that finding those materials are difficult, but the equally difficult thing is trying to find methods in order to piece together a very fragmented history and a history where the archive is already set against the people that it's that it's speaking about. Um, so some folks have done, for example, oral histories as a way to sort of counter the um, archives own biases. Um, I myself have experimented with, for example, taking um, a piece of the archive and trying to return it to the kinds of people who maybe were discussed in those texts. Um, but then we run against the run up against the question of um, finding participants who are willing to speak to you. So many of the people who I've been interested in um, have either passed or maybe are in their 70s and 80s. Most Koreans who are 70 or 80, most Koreans, period, um, got married um, or were in. Uh, uh, participated in married life and so often they would have children and maybe even if I could locate them they didn't want to speak about their stories because this could negatively affect their own um, children. So you know those are some of the problems, the very real problems about doing historical research and my own approach has been to try to make those as transparent as possible. So. Um, the, in, the impossibility of doing an oral history, for example, is something that's worth speaking about as much an oral history that produces some kind of data or empirical evidence. So that's been um, one of my um, approaches to try to deal with these um, kinds of um, materials that are, you know, very fragmented and which don't paint um, a full picture of, of, of human lives. So we just get very um, small snippets um, if there's some kind of incident or event. Um, so I've had to be very um, creative and the other authors in their own way, very creative about trying to fill in some of those um, gaps. Um, just really quickly about my own activism. Last year, one of the things I tried to work on a little bit was um, the problem of housing discrimination because um, in South Korea, um, they often require uh, marriage certificates for people uh, to live in family housing. So as you all know, in 85% of the world, there it's impossible to be same-sex married. Uh, some people don't want to get married, um, but many universities in Korea require marriage certificates in order to live with your um, partner. So I was trying to working with this a student group at SNU to try to change some of those regulations. 
Um, and the other thing I was um, active in last year was PFLAG. So PFLAG has a pretty um, important uh, presence in South Korea. This is the parents and families of gay and lesbian people. And in a place where it's very difficult to get um, um, counseling or there's a stigma against seeing a counselor when speaking about LGBT issues is very, very difficult. Um, PFLAG has formed a really important role in South Korea. They meet every month and sort of have like a group therapy session. Um, there's a trained counselor who comes, sometimes parents who have gay and lesbian children or children who are transitioning will come to those meetings and seek support from other parents who have had children who have had similar experience. Sometimes it's a gay and, les or gay and lesbian or trans child who wants to come out or talk to their parents, but feels if they talk to their parents, they will be alienated or thrown out of their house. Um, so um, my work has simply been to listen actually to their stories. Um, and as I said, I try to be an ally in their um, activities. I, I'm not ethnically Korean and me saying something in an academic book or me coming out or me doing something has very different consequences than it does for um, Koreans. Um, so my work um, aims to try to empower um, those groups as best I can. Uh, Todd, we've got so many questions. So you'll, uh, you know, maybe we can run a few minutes after because there's so much interest in this topic. For those of us who don't follow this uh, closely, can you just give our audience a broad sense of where the queer community is now with respect to protections, legal protections? What's the nature of the of the conflicts now? We know that Taiwan has moved ahead and has uh, gotten to gay marriage. Korea is a far cry from that, but but where do we stand in terms of other legal protections? What are the issues? I mean, the major issue, and a lot of the activists have been working on this, is uh, to get instituted an anti-discrimination law. So there is no law on the books that, um, that makes uh, discrimination against this group of minorities some kind of offense. So there is a human rights commission in South Korea. So if there is some kind of abuse or you're fired at work, you could go to the commission. The commission can make recommendations, but there's no enforcement possible. There's no laws for same-sex marriage on the books um, in South Korea. Um, the other area that's been a very large issue is the holdover of military laws 92-6. Actually, one of the few places in which homosexuality or being transgender enters South Korean law is in the context of military service. And six, since 1961, there is a law that forbids, it's actually very vague. Um, it says anal intercourse, supposedly that's directed at men who are in the military. It's never been used against a uh, man who has anal sex with a woman. Um, but it basically says that if you're in the military, you cannot have um, sexual relations with another man. Even if you're on R&R, &R, even if you have the weekend off and you go and visit your boyfriend in another city and you go to a hotel, officially you could be punished and thrown out of the military. Mm -hmm. um, other, other issues revolve around transgender inclusion. Uh, there's a recent incident of a transgender um, student uh, born male but transitioned to be a woman, is a legal woman, applied to a woman's university, was accepted, um, and then the students at that university posted all these things online saying that she wasn't welcome at the woman's university and she um, has uh, withdrawn her acceptance to the university. So if there were an anti-discrimination law at um, universities or at companies or even more broadly at the national level, I think there would be greater possibility to um, adjudicate problems uh, when they come up. But it's, it's, it's often in the law a sort of non-issue. It's neither talked about nor not talked about. So there's no law in the book other than the military law that um, criminalizes um, homosexuality as we see in some places let's say in Africa, for example, but that doesn't mean that 
um, homophobia doesn't happen. And to go back to one of Jin's questions, you know, this happens in a very subtle, uh, banal way. So, you know, just the question of, are you married, which is a question because most people in Korea get married. But if you're um, a gay or lesbian person and someone asks you, you know, do you, why aren't you married? That in and itself is a kind of question that um, is, is laden with a certain kind of assumption about one's um, preferences. So people who are, you know, working for large corporations uh, who are unmarried, if their bosses say, you know, I'd like to set you up with a girl or I'd like to set you up with a guy, even though you're attracted to the same sex and have a boyfriend or girlfriend, you might go on the date with someone from the opposite sex simply so that your boss likes you and you get promoted. Um, if you said, I have a boyfriend, I don't want to meet your girl, um, you know, the consequences in terms of being fired at a job or not given a promotion or ostracized or, you know, put into some, you know, division of the company that doesn't do important work, all of these things might be um, a consequence. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That's helpful. Uh, let me bundle together a couple of questions. There's a great question here that's a personal question, but I think it's an appropriate one. And that is, and it's, it's phrased really well. It says um, that you discovered a queer Todd Henry at the same time you discovered a queer Korea. And I don't know if you think that's a fair characterization, but the question goes on to ask how you think about your role simultaneously as scholar and activist, and whether you think that helps. Is there any way that you think it might impede your scholarship? How do you balance those kind of things together? And then let me bundle two other questions with that. Both of them have to do with your role uh, in, in uh, pushing these issues in Korea. What's the status of queer studies? Have you had any success in that regard in terms of moving the agenda along of getting scholarship going in this area? And in particular, um, one questioner notes that SNU has been an interesting site of resistance in this area recently. Uh, could you tell us more from your experience there? I mean, this is an elite university, the elite university in the country. Yet at the same time, it seems like it's been uh, students there have also been quite active. So that's that's putting a lot on your plate. But uh, but if you can take those on, I think they come together around this issue of the personal and activism and how you square those things. Yeah, it is quite true that my own my own development um, as a gay man and as a scholar happened in the context of um, studying Korea. So um, my my own um, my own orientation has been um, to take advantage or to put those two things into dialogue, um, hopefully in a, in a critical way. As I mentioned um, with the issue of coming out and the stakes of trying to, you know, write this kind of scholarship or do this kind of scholarship in North America um, is very different than it is um, in South Korea where there are no queer studies programs that that's not that doesn't exist and where um i don't think there is any or there hasn't been any classes that have been dedicated to um this topic um so there are certain uh, certainly student interest in it and there's now a, a network of graduate students and young scholars who are doing um, very important um, queer work. They tend to meet on their own, have small gatherings, but the problem has been that they need the support of their advisors and they need their support of their peers. So even if they publish an article, let's say in the field of sociology, writing on LGBT rights and they submit it to a journal and the journal sends it out to review, those people who it's being sent out to review with are maybe 40 and 50 year old men because um, the male population predominates in South Korean academic circles. And if they don't like that topic, regardless of the quality, you know, they might reject it, they don't know what to do with it. And so, the field of study has been very slow um, to develop, um, although there is great student interest. When I've taught these uh, kinds of topics in South Korea during summer school, I found that many of the students are want to write papers on the topics and were very appreciative. So 
there is a, you know, there's a kind of catch-22. Why is it that someone who looks like me, uh, who's a man who's white and who's from the U.S., is allowed to speak about South Korean queer topics, but when it comes to Korean folks, they're not given the space to do so, or if they're given the space to do so, they're put in a position in which they're very vulnerable. So I do feel um, a bit conflicted. Um, and this time around, when some people contacted me from the media um, asking about if I would speak about COVID, you know, my first impulse it was, and the first thing I did was to direct them to my activist friends who have a lot more to say about this issue than I do. Um, so I suppose my, my, own, um, my own practice is to try to work with them and, but, but defer to them to the extent possible and use their expertise so that, so that I learn from them. And so that you know, scholars in the US who don't know Korea um, can learn from the Korean case um, and that's why I tried in the book to make some efforts to translate pieces that were written in Korean that folks in the U.S. could use as a, as a platform for, for understanding. Um, so it's not just, you know, Judith Butler and all these famous people who are translated into Korean and then are read in Korean and adopted to, in, in Korean context. And I've seen Korean scholars and intellectuals read the articles and say, wait a minute, you know, this is really smart, but it, this, this doesn't fit our situation. Right. So, you know, we have to use other cases and allow Korean scholars to make their own theories from their own struggles and have those theories translated um, into English and reach a non-Korean, a Korean studies audience, but then an LGBT studies audience who can learn from Korean. So I view my role as trying to bridge or connect the various parties in, in, in the best way I can. Yeah, that's great. Um, we've got so many questions here that I think I'm gonna take the liberty of extending us five minutes past our normal witching hour. And I wanna start with two questions that raise this interesting issue of sexual ambiguity. When I was reading the book, um, when, when queer communities are, are repressed, ambiguity, sexual ambiguity becomes a way of communicating. And these questions, I think, uh, raise this uh, issue in an interesting way. So one questioner uh, had an argument with another student from Korea about the trans community and said that, and this, this uh, person who was an interlocutor said, look, I can't support the trans community because they're adopting and reinforcing feminine traditions, which Korean women are trying to get away from. And trying to shed in some way, you know, these, these kinds of images. So that was one side. And then another question asked about the Korean wave and the highly androgynous nature of the boy groups in particular, and whether you've uh, tackled that question about the Korean wave and androgynity. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good question. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose one of the things that the authors in the book try to do is to um, be very uh, culturally specific um, about um, instances, let's say, of um, you said sexual ambiguity or certain kind of gender presentation. So the picture that I showed you earlier of the two women getting married, when I gave the presentation in Korea, one of the professors who listened to the talk said, oh, I don't think they're women. They just look like someone in a hanbok and a, and a suit. Um, and that's probably during the 1960s and the 1970s, the only way you could present yourself at a wedding ceremony. It would have been impossible for two women to appear in dresses. At least I've never seen that kind of presentation. So if part of your gender presentation um, is meant at, um, again, being off the radar, as a kind of survival strategy or survival tactic, then who am I or who are we to say that, let's say that's a certain kind of um, heterosexual mimicry um, that here lesbian couples simply copying um, straight styles. Um, in fact, this point was taken up um, in American studies um, as well 
um, a book written about um, same-sex couples in 1960s and 70s U.S. also found very similar kinds of examples um, of what looks on the outside like mimicry and the mass media actually calls it mimicry in a way by saying here's the husband and here's the wife. This is the media's attempt to try to accommodate queerness as a kind of monstrosity. But that doesn't mean that the internal codes of two women dressing in that kind of way necessarily were consciously trying to mimic. Um, maybe they were about survival. Um, maybe that was the only kind of um, vocabulary or style that was available at that time. So I think we have to be very careful about how we identify or misidentify certain kinds of practices and styles as being um, retrograde or um, behind or out of line. Um, so that's certainly what I would have to say about that. Um, the other thing about K-pop that I, I'm not an expert of K-pop, but the studies that I've read and the pieces in the volume uh, that speak about this show that, you know, this can go one of two ways. Um, on the one hand, it might, you know, kind of promote a certain kind of playing with different kinds of non-normative um, practices and styles. And we've seen those, for example, um, in the article by Lyung Shin in the volume about how K-pop um, allowed uh, certain um, masculine identified women to um, try on new kinds of clothes and new kinds of styles. And then she shows that when a certain kind of backlash and homophobia emerged, that those people um, left physical space and went into online space. So it's one thing for something to be represented in media, um, whether it be K-pop or whether it be print media or film media as a certain kind of fantasy or a certain kind of practice of consumption, particularly aimed, let's say, at a group of girls who, for whom a soft masculinity is better than a hard masculinity that involves aggression or involves patriarchy or involves sexual violence. So the m media industries are, you know, feeding a certain consumer base those images um, partly as a as a as a fantasy or as a as a outlet for their own daily struggles but whether that um, translates into real political change um, and activism on the ground in real space and in legislation or policy that's completely a different issue um, yeah. Well, that, that, that leads directly to another question, which is, um, is whether there are different spaces and disciplines in which Korean queer cultural studies are maybe more accepted. And one of the things that the questioner asks is about the arts, um, because, you know, Korean film yeah. is incredibly edgy and progressive. And, you know, sometimes you wonder if it's prurient or even voyeuristic, but nonetheless is taking a lot of risks in this space. Uh, what do you see there? That's clearly a broad open area of, of both study and consumption and representation, right? Yeah, this is one of the reasons why when we had the um, Queer Korea event at UCSD in 2014 that we had an art installation by a feminist queer artist named Seiden and her subject matter was a very popular form of all-female theater. Um, it had its heyday in the 1950s and then kind of fell off in the 1960s when the state didn't um, patronize this kind of form of art, which was seen as vulgar because women were playing male roles. Um, but it really has been, I think, um, artists, um, and other intellectuals, maybe not at universities. There's a space in Korea for intellectual activity that might not mean you're a professor at a university or you're a tenure track scholar, but maybe you're an artist part-time and you're a lecturer part-time. Those are the people actually who have had the greatest freedom to, to, to express themselves. Um, and there are some fascinating films um, that are made about Korea's queer past that are sort of models for me because those filmmakers really did for themselves a lot of archival research, which is what I do. The final product I produce is an article or a book, theirs is a film 
And they found really, really interesting ways to, for example, do interviews with older gay men um, and found out stories about different parts of cities that were used by gay men or frequented by gay men or certain kind of cafes that had a zone where women who were attracted to other women could meet one another. Um, so those kinds of filmmakers and, and producers of art have really been inspirational um, for me. Um, and one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm writing an article which is about South Korean filmmakers as historians because they have really produced the best and most innovative work which takes you know a small fragment of something um, and expanded it into a whole story um, that you know when I show them the films to my students um, they just kind of blow their minds yeah. um, that alongside you know marriage there were all kinds of other um, spaces in which same-sex sexuality um, and areas of gender variance, let's say, in the theater was was tolerated. Well, Todd, I'm not seeing any out-migration, so let me, uh, we still have 75 people with us, so let me ask two more questions and then we will conclude. The first has to do with this most recent batch of COVID cases in Itaewon and the portrayal of those as somehow possibly being linked to gay bars in Itaewon and, and so on, which raises the question of whether this, uh, is this the way you have read the press on this question? Is there some representation here? It sounds almost AIDS-ish, if you know what I mean. It's very AIDS-ish, and uh, that's one of the points I tried to make in that NPR um, uh, interview is that these things are layered. So there is a, there's a kind of um, reservoir of homophobia that it only takes COVID to kind of resurrect. So the kind of AIDS panic that happened in the 1980s in Korea as the Olympics were coming up in 1988. Um, I, I personally think that that's the moment when homophobia really begins in South Korea, institutionalized homophobia. And interestingly, if you're a historian, you look further back because AIDS was described um, as the 20th century Hansen's disease or leprosy because of the kind of deformation of the body that's caused by Hansen's disease. So AIDS in the 80s was drawing on leprosy from the late 19th, early 20th century. And I think these debates, um, it was mostly from a Christian newspaper step, the Kunmin Ilbo, that identified it as a gay bar. Um, and this is a context where, you know, lots of people have been cooped up in their house and they think that Korea has gone past, you know, the point of it being dangerous to be out and about. It was a long weekend and lots of people went out. So I'm sure the gays went to the gay bar and the straights went to the state straight bar and the ajumas and the ajoshis were out mountain climbing and people were going to Jeju. So, um, I do think that there is a certain kind of way in which the media has to be very careful about, you know, you don't need to know every single place somebody went in order to do contact tracing. And you do have to, I think, anonymize um, some of the, you know, places that they've been. Um, well, look, I've managed to get to all questions except one. And in some ways, it's a question which really wraps everything up. And so I'm going to read it. It's one, two sentences. It says, I understand there are LGBTQ uh, people in South Korea. However, what is queer about queer Korea now? And let me give my own twist on this question, which may not be intended. Uh, you chose the name queer Korea. Obviously, the term queer has a long and um, partly ugly history before being embraced by the community. Um, to say more about that choice of the title and whether there's something similar that resonates in Korea about the history of queer, per se. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the term itself, of course, is new, and the term is one, as you know, that was reappropriated when it was from a very pejorative use to one that was a very inclus inclusive use. Now in Korea, queer is used as a, as a word um, as well with a completely different um, meaning. I'd say the queerness of queer Korea has to do with the point I made about 
the politics of inclusion and exclusion. I mean, I do think there is much to say about laws and protections um, and the way in which, for example, you know, things like same-sex marriage have that, that were responses to, in this country, um, the AIDS um, epidemic and the inability of lovers and friends to mourn their relatives. Um, that there's a very clear genealogy of how we've developed um, in this country towards certain kinds of inclusions, but we should also be weary that, again, at the same time that we have inclusions for same-sex marriage, we have, you know, anti-Black racism that never stops. We have the violence against, um, you know, transgender people of color um, for whom, you know, inclusion is not a possibility. So even as South Korean activists are pushing their own state and their own society towards greater forms of inclusion, I think at the same time, we should look at other ways in which we can support communities that might not rely on the media, um, might not rely on the state, might not rely on the kinds of institutions that we will seemingly always go to for empowerment. Um, and maybe there is a way in which our communities can be empowered from within. Um, I think that is, for me, what I take away from, from a study of queerness in Korea. Um, and so recently, I've been thinking a lot about trying to interface um, in queer studies in the US, people of color queer critiques, which don't look at assimilation, but look at exclusion and marginalization. Right. Um, putting those debates alongside the kind of struggles that take place in Korea um, as a way of, again, trying to create an interface and new kinds of dialogues that don't see, you know, same-sex marriage as, you know, the end all where you just close shop and say we've reached the end. That's clearly not the case. So um, we need laws and we need protections and we also need other kinds of more radical communities that um, are able to protect, defend, and enhance their livelihood. Todd, it's really been a pleasure to uh, enjoy this conversation with you. We all need this kind of uh, uplift at the end, and it was exactly the right message, as well as the sentiment I think many of us share. Uh, thanks to Joe, to Munsub, to Jin Kyung for, for joining us. And uh, I just really had a sense from listening to this conversation that you've you've started a, a kind of ball rolling, not on your own, but you've come along at the right moment. And when this book gets translated into Korean, maybe we can have you back to talk about its reception in Korea, because that's going to be very interesting. Anyway, thanks all for joining us. Thank you so much. If you want to get into uh, our webinar series over the next couple of days, we have a one tomorrow in Japan, and then one next Monday, a more traditional issue about the succession uh, feel free to register, and thanks very much for joining us today. Bye, all.